Hey, thanks for joining us today at this house that we call More. My name's Pastor Tim, and I get to be the ministry's pastor here. And we're so excited that you've joined us because we know no matter where you are on your journey with Jesus, that today's message is going to speak more into you than you ever thought or even imagined maybe was possible. Before we start, we want to remind you to go ahead and subscribe and ring that bell so you never miss a single moment of everything that God is doing here at this house. With that, we're going to jump right into the message. So let's get started. So glad that you're here today in the house of the Lord. You know, we have about 40 men at a retreat uh, this weekend, including Pastor Trustin and Pastor Aaron and Pastor Tim. And so, uh, man, I'm so glad all y'all showed up because I was like, 40 dudes are gonna be gone. Some of them are serving at it. Some of them are being served at it. And, uh, but y'all showed up, thank goodness. So it's so good. But yeah, you keep shouting and hollering back because my husband is forced to say amen. You know, that's like part of the job. And so you, you can help me out by doing that. Anyway, uh, we're in a brand new series. Well, we started it last week devil versus default. How many of you were here and got the opportunity to hear it? Man, it was incredible. As Pastor Trustin kind of uh, opened up this idea, helping us understand that there is a real enemy, but there's also a real default in our life. And we have to kind of examine it and understand it in order to move forward into the more that God has for our life. So if you were not here and you missed it, I challenge you go back and watch it. Like go and, and you're not gonna wanna miss any week because they're gonna all build upon each other. So I would just challenge you to go back and take a look at it. Um, I'm excited about this series because it's something that God's been teaching us and working through us in a long, for a long time. And in my life for several years, it's really been something he's really uh, been working from the inside out and really helping me grow and step into all the more that God has. And that's what we want for you here. That's our hope and our heart is that you would lean into it and be willing to evaluate and say, oh man, yeah, God, I need, I need that. I need some help. I remember about uh, two summers ago, we were at the center, which is uh, a building that we had before the other building that we had before here. And... <laughs> I remember I was at the back of the auditorium and I was kind of complaining to Lava. Lava is one of our elders. She's always in the back praying for us. Uh, I was honestly, if I'm honest, that's what I was doing. I was just whining. I was frustrated. There's some things the enemy has attacked. I can't believe it. He's attacking all the things. If he would just stop attacking, then maybe we could move forward. Maybe we can make progress. But why in the world don't he stop attacking? And I'm just kind of whining to her. And she said, hey, Whitney, sometimes... The enemy is not always attacking the way you think. Sometimes God has things he needs you to learn. And until you're ready to learn them, you might be going around the mountain again. <laughs> the enemy does bring attack into our life. But also, God doesn't bring bad things to us, but he will allow some things in, in life so that we will learn and understand and grow and step into it. And he waits on us sometimes to get those things. And I was like, shut up, Lola. Why are you guys say that? Because <laughs> she was right. There were some things in me that God was trying to work out. There were some things that he knew I needed to unpack and put out on the table to deal with before I was ready for the more he had. And in his kindness and in his goodness, he knew that if I stepped into some of those things before I did that, I would actually cause me more harm, actually cause me more damage. And I think some of you are here today and you're like waiting. God, I, I've been waiting on the more you have for me. I, I know there is more, but I feel like, is there really, are you really not done with me yet? And I believe he would say, I have more, but I need you to start examining your default so you can deal with that before I bring the more into your life. And so we're reading this key verse every week, Romans 8, 37. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. What that means is in all these things, whatever it is that you're walking through, whatever it is you're trying to work out, whatever it is that you know you need to navigate, in all those things, you are more than a conqueror. Through Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, you have all access, and now he can bring the victory in your life. You can conquer, you can rebuke the devil, and you can have victory. We are quick to rebuke the devil, but we don't always like to take the time to examine our default. Is it the devil? Or is it our default? And the answer is, it's probably both. 
In this series, we are going to understand the spiritual attack and our natural tendencies. In this series, we're going to expose the devil and examine our default. Our default is our natural tendencies, our human knee-jerk reaction and response to situations and circumstances in life. And our default, Pastor Trustin taught us last week, is determined by three things, our development, our disadvantages, and our damages. Our development, where we grew up, how we grew up, the family we grew up in, what part of the country we grew up in, and he talked about even the birth order last week of, of our lives, and he talked about those incredible firstborns who just love to have things helpful, organized, and sometimes struggle with being in control. He talked about those babies who, you know, need us firstborns because they sometimes, uh, you know, have had things done for them, and so they struggle to get started a little bit in things. And then he talked about the only children who uh, are, he said, amazing, but also sometimes a little self-centered because it was always about them, so why shouldn't it always be always about them, right? And then appropriately, he also left out the middle child, (laughs) which is basically par for the course, right? The amount of middle children who came up to me last Sunday and said, what about me? I'm like, well, Clearly you have a default to work through, but we did forget about you. You're right. (laughs) And then our disadvantages. Maybe in life there were things you lacked, opportunities that you lacked, actual tangible things, money, or the provision that you needed. There were maybe some abilities that you lacked that held you back and that determined a default in your life. And then maybe you had actual damages, real hurt, real pain, real trauma. All of us have suffered some form of damage in life and season and a time and a place where we didn't feel safe and where we actually had something overwhelming us uh, in order to get over it. And so our development, our disadvantages, and our damages, we've all got at least something a part of one of those three things. That means we all have default. And if we don't identify and deal with our default, then it will be the doorway for the devil to bring in destruction. Ephesians 4, 27 tells us, do not give the devil a foothold. In your life, don't give him a foothold. What's a foothold? Well, you know when you tell your kids they need to clean their room and they get really mad and you're like, go to your room. You're not doing, you're not playing video games. You're not going anywhere. You're not doing anything else till you clean your room, right? And they want to storm off and slam the door, right? And right before they slam it, you put your foot right in there and say, hold on. You don't get to be all mad at me like this. You're gonna leave this door open so I can make sure you're in here actually doing what I told you to do, right? That's a foothold. And in your life, we can try as hard as we want to slam the door, but if we don't deal with the things that are holding us back, then the devil has a great chance to just put his foot in the door and hold on to it and allow things to slip through the cracks. If we are unwilling to determine our default, then we are defenseless to deadbolt the door. And the enemy then can have a really, he already has a strategic plan. The Bible tells us that he comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy your life. That he's roaming around like a roaring lion, seeing who he can devour. He wants to devour you and your kids and your family and your future. But if you are willing to say, no, I won't even let the devil have a foothold, not even just this little much bit that he could slip in into my life, then then you will actually be able to beat the schemes of the enemy. We're gonna talk a little bit more about the schemes of the enemy in the next few weeks, but we wanna make sure we fully understand our default before we move forward. Because the devil is gonna keep trying to drop destruction in your life. Is it the devil or is it your default? It's both. But I wanna talk a little bit this morning about how to fight the foothold and then how to determine your default. Because it's hard to uh, determine the default until we've dealt with the foothold first. And the first, there's two ways, really, two powerful weapons to yield when you're fighting uh, the devil and your default. And the first one is self-awareness. Self-awareness is the starting point to success. Uh, I always, I love Pastor Phil and Mick. I'm so like thankful for them, but I always feel like bad for them. Cause like the hardest part of their job is probably when people try out and think they can sing and have not the self-awareness to know that they can't sing, right? We're trying, Rach, we're trying, but they won't let us on the team. I don't understand. Self-awareness 
is being able to look at yourself. It's what happens when you allow your brain to accept itself and its shortcomings. We don't like to accept our shortcomings. We actually create, our brain creates all kinds of strategies to protect ourselves from discomfort. And one of them is lying to ourselves about ourselves. We don't like to be the villain in our own story, so we stay the victim so that we don't have to look at the things that we actually haven't let go of. But self-awareness is essential to being able to defeat the enemy and fight the foothold. Self-awareness is when you audit who you actually truly are. Take time to actually audit, not who you present on Sunday, not who you present to the people that you're trying to impress in your neighborhood, not the way you present yourself to your boss when you think he's around, but maybe act a different way when he's not, right? But self-awareness is actually auditing who you are when you're just sitting by yourself in your bedroom. Self-awareness is being aware of what you're feeling and why you're feeling it in real time. And then being able, the next step is being able to adjust your behavior in that moment. Ooh, they said that hurt my feelings. Now I wanna fight. Oh, I'm not gonna fight. But, but sometimes we just wanna dismiss that and then what happens? We get in a fight, right? Self-awareness is the hallway for the Holy Spirit to bring healing to the brokenness of our defaults. Self-awareness is the hallway for the Holy Spirit to bring healing to the brokenness of our defaults. It's essential, it's necessary. Psalms 139, 23, 24, David, King David wrote, search me, God, know my heart, Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Search me, God. In fact, Psalm 139 starts with search me, God, and ends with search me, God, because David knew it's a constant battle, that the enemy is constantly going to be after the most valuable thing, which is our heart, which is connected to our mind which then controls everything that we do. And so we have to be willing to be self-aware enough to say, God, search me. I know I'm fearfully, wonderfully made in your image, but I also got some defaults in here because I'm human. And I need you to search me and help me, test me and let me know about it. See if there's anything in here and help lead me. Lead me. The second thing, so self-awareness is essential. Second thing is spiritual awareness. Spiritual awareness is when you understand that there is a very real struggle, not against flesh and blood, but of spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. Spiritual awareness is being aware of the enemy and his attack in real time. Because it's not just prop psychology that we're talking about today. It's, it, the default is something that the enemy strategically uses to bring all kind of destruction into our life. But we can be set free. We can be more than conquerors. And so spiritual awareness allows us to be aware of the enemy in real time and then be able to flee, rebuke, call on the name of Jesus, call on the help of our community in order to overcome it. Spiritual awareness recognizes that I am more than a conqueror, that I do have all access to the Holy Spirit that I do have all authority in Christ. And last week we said it, I I will keep saying it over and over again. If you do not define your default, you are defenseless to deadbolt the door against the enemy. And so you have to take the steps and you have to take the Holy Spirit with you when you do it. It's essential. We need self-awareness and spiritual awareness to identify our defaults. Okay, Pastor Whit, then how do we do that? Well, that's what we're gonna talk about next. It's so exciting. So my husband, who's not here, he uh, is, I have to just keep reminding him he's not here, but uh, he's not even listening, but he's not here. (laughs) Uh, 
He's a pilot by trade. He now manages airports, but in the very beginning of his well, like career and all things, he's pilot, he still is. And so we go together and fly in planes. We've flown a lot. He knows a lot about them. And what I know is that in the cockpit, like our car, we have a dashboard, right? But in the cockpit of a plane, it's like all of these instruments, so many uh, instruments that are the readings and the controls, the steering wheel, the brake, the operations, the changes, the shifts, how it maneuvers, but also like the temperature gauges and the oil and all of the pieces. And it tells you kind of everything that's happening. That's where you look in the plane. In fact, they teach you so much that you look there, you don't even need to look above and out the window in order to fly the plane. And there's all these different buttons and some of them, when things arrive, arise, they will start to flash. When there's a caution situation going on in the plane, they will start to flash yellow. And it'll make kind of a quiet beep, beep, like, hello, pay attention to me, right? Do something about this. And you can actually push the button of a yellow button to silence it if you want to, and it will be quiet, but it'll keep flashing yellow. And that gives you time to think to actually fix the issue that's happening without annoying yellow bu bu buzzing noise, whatever, happening <laughs> in your brain. But if you don't do anything about it, here pretty quick, that yellow light turns red. And then that red light is flashing an emergency and it's wah, wah, like so loud you can't think. And the truth is an emergency is on its way. It is inevitable. And the goal is to deal with it while it's still in caution mode. The goal is to see the yellow light illuminating and say, I'm gonna handle this now before it turns into an emergency. And in the cockpit, the beautiful thing about that though, is that there is cause and effect. They're all labeled. You know where it's coming from. Is it an engine situation? Is it an oil situation? These are the only words I'm gonna use because I don't know anything else to say. But <laughs> they're labeled so that you can solve the problem. And the more proficient a pilot is, the more they know how to detect where the caution button, what's illuminating, what it's connected to, and how to solve it quickly. But also if they don't, there's a manual that they can look at, right Benji? Benji's learning how to fly right now. There's a manual that you can learn. What's this button connected to? Why is it flashing this way? How can I help? And in our life, the frustrating thing is, there's all kind of caution moments that pop up. And we have a choice whether to deal with it while it's yellow or whether to let it turn red and become a five alarm fire alert. But the frustrating thing is it's not labeled for us. That in the dashboard of our life, we just have to figure it out ourselves with the help of the Holy Spirit. And so today, I, I just wanna encourage you. Have you looked at your dashboard in a while? Have, have you actually seen what's popping off? Your default is likely the thing that turns yellow as soon as you put yourself in an uncomfortable situation. Your default is usually a pattern that happens time and time again. That's why the pilots know what it means because they have patterns that happen in flying. They have checklists they follow. Oh, okay, here's what's going on. In your life, do you have patterns of yellow illuminating lights that pop up time and time again? Can you identify what's happening? What's flowing out of you? What's popping off of you? How do I do that? Well, one of the best ways, Matthew 12, 34, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What's coming out of your mouth? Or not coming out, but should. Out of the abundance of what's in here is what will start to come out here. When I was a kid, I thought that verse was just what my mom was telling me so I wouldn't say cuss words. But it's so much more than that. What's in here gets out here and you have to pay attention to what's coming out of your mouth so you can see what light is actually flashing. Are you speaking in negativity? Are you speaking in worry and fear? Or are you speaking in truth? Are you speaking out of insecurity? Are you being passive aggressive? Are you being aggressively aggressive? Which one is it? 
What's coming out of your mouth? Here's why. Because Proverbs 4.23, we all know it, above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. Your heart is constantly under attack because it's the most valuable thing because everything in your life is connected to what flows out of here. And that's why the enemy is constantly trying to steal it, to get in it, to plant a seed of bitterness, to plant a seed of insecurity, to plant a seed of pride, so that you will actually destruct your own life for him. And he doesn't even have to do that much work. But what's popping off? What's flowing out of you? What triggers you, we would say, right? Well, that's just a trigger for me. Well, the trigger is your issue, not somebody else's issue who triggered you. What's popping off? You know, in my life, I had to evaluate and learn that there were a lot of yellow things that I needed to deal with. And some of them I handled quick and, and well, and some of them I just said, it's not that big a deal, and pushed the yellow button. When I first got married, I came from a home of people who yell and fight and scream, and whoever is the loudest wins, right? Whoever can have the best argument wins, right? Aaron came from a home that was more peaceful and quiet, and they did not fight or argue. Um, and, and when we came together, this was like a giant issue for us. Because if he's not yelling at me, then I think he doesn't love me. And so I'm just gonna yell louder, right? If I yell loud enough, then eventually he'll yell back at me and then we can actually do this thing, right? And I thought, well, it's not a big deal. It's just the fact that that's just how we communicate. We're working, we'll figure it out. We're working through it. But soon that pattern turned into a even greater pattern. And every time I started to be confronted with any kind of uncomfortable situation, I would first get defensive and then I would yell. These were my patterns over and over again. But defensive is good. I'm defending myself. No. Defensive keeps you from dealing with your default. And there's all kinds of other defaults that pop off that ap appear as positive. They don't always appear as negative. Are you saying sorry everywhere in your life constantly because you're second guessing yourself over and over again? Well, I'm just being polite to say sorry. No, somewhere there's a default that tells you that you are not good enough, that you must apologize over and over again, that if you don't actually, it, it speaks to the fact that you think no one trusts you and therefore you probably don't trust them. Oh, I'm just trying to make sure everyone's happy. So you're running around, people pleasing everyone, trying to make everyone happy, trying to bring peace, trying to be a peacekeeper rather than a peacemaker. I did that so much of my life because I was the oldest child, like they're connected. So the firstborn daughter is the one trying to make the peace between the chaos and the home. But instead, because I'm, it's out of my control, I'm just a peacekeeper. So I'm balancing and juggling the emotions of all the people around me, and I'm just trying to help. That's a default that presents as positive, but is actually really negative to my life. And as I continued to just push the yellow button, then life continued to happen. When I turned 30, my parents went through a divorce, and I grew up a kid of ministry. Like, my dad was a pastor. This was something I did not know. Like, no one I knew was divorced. No one in our family was divorced. This was a earth-shattering thing for my life, and it, it broke my heart. My parents had been married 36 years when they got divorced. My dad uh, decided to leave. It was no longer uh, working out. What I found out later is really their marriage had been broken since about the time I was four years old which is why that pattern became a damaged default in my life. But the anger, the hurt, and the frustration of this new damage caused me so much confusion in my own marriage that I just began to take this yellow caution light and it became red really fast. Because 
Now I definitely don't know what's gonna happen here and I'm unsure if I can trust you or not. And so I'm gonna just tell you everything I feel so you know it and it doesn't matter if it's kind, it doesn't matter if it's true, it doesn't matter how, how I feel is what matters in this moment. And I began to yell, I began to push him away, I began to say, you're gonna leave anyway, go ahead and leave right now. I began to say all kind of words that sound crazy and aren't my character. But because... I was so hurt and broken and hadn't dealt with that very first default. Then it so easily, the enemy was able to then take it and turn it into a giant piece of destruction in my life. And so I went to counseling and I'm like, I need to work through my daddy issues, right? That's what we do. And I was like, that's about what it's about. That's about it. That wasn't about it, (laughs) right? You laugh because you know. That's not it. There's all kind of it that I needed to deal with and work through. I remember uh, then a few years later on the 4th of July, we call it the 4th of July moment in our home, like for real, embarrassing, but it's true. We had always done this event called Rock and Forth in Mansfield where we'd served it and worked it and we were there and so we were busy because sometimes keeping yourself busy is a default that you have in your life so you don't have to actually deal with what's going on. Some of us ladies be trying to keep ourselves busy all weekend because our husbands be gone. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, and so uh, when... I don't remember what year it was exactly, but they stopped doing it the way they had done it, and so they didn't need us to volunteer anymore, which meant then we didn't have plans anymore, which meant that then that 4th of July, we're just like cooking burgers as a family, hanging out, saw a couple friends, went back home, and it was a beautiful day. But somehow, I made it a horrible day. I started yelling and freaking out. I had this anxiety rise up inside of me that it's not fun enough, it's not good enough, it's not what it should be, and I start just telling everybody in my house, you don't even care, you don't even make plans, you, how do you even lead your home? You can't even lead your home making a 4th of July, what, what? None of it made any sense, but I hadn't dealt yet with the fact that the 4th of July had been my favorite holiday, that I went with my family and they put on a really good smile and they were nice all day, and we got to be with my cousins that I love and we got to swim and eat watermelon and hang out with my grandparents who were really the the deep emotional support in my life. And now that was gone because of the brokenness of my parents' relationship. And I had yet to deal with how much that actually hurt me. And I had yet to create new patterns to allow myself to process it properly. And so then it's like, okay, I will never let that happen again. I will not freak out. I will not do the things, right? And I'm trying to make all the steps. And then there was one day I'm in uh, my closet and Easton and I, my son and I have had like uh, the kind of relationship where like if he's in the shower, I can throw cold water on him, right? And then, but that he might throw cold water back on me and then like he might shut the door and turn the light off and then I'm in the dark and cold and all, right? We would tease each other. But one day I'm in the closet like looking for something and he just comes up behind me to scare me. But in that moment, he's like, boo, like just silly. I turn around red, only seeing red and responding in anger. How dare you? I can't believe you would do this. Why are you trying to get out of here? What in the world is happening? That's not how I respond to my son. That's not the relationship that we have. But I had yet to deal with the moments in my life where I felt backed up against the wall. And therefore, I, I reacted out of fear and out of frustration and out of completely different than I would want to respond. And I had to realize that whether or not we realize it or not, what is happening on the inside will always show on the outside. Even when we think we're good at hiding it. Even with, when only the family knows about the 4th of July event. But nobody at church does. Nobody in life group does. Nobody at work does, right? Right? but what's inside always shows on the outside. It might be small at first. It might be minimal at first, 
but eventually it will be a red five alarm fire that everyone around you can see. And it's not fun. <laughs> Aaron and I talk about it all the time because my personality at least wants to solve the problem. He's, he's more like, we're just chill. Let's just stay chill. This is not fun. We don't need to do this. We talked about it this week. And I felt it strongly even last week as it was presented in the room. Because half of you are like, yeah, let's solve it. Let's do it. Let's, be, let's figure it out. And half of you are like, that is not for me. I, that's cool. You're trying to do that. That's cool. Good for you. I'll sit here. I'll smile. I'll nod. But I ain't trying to do all that. But what we have to recognize is there were people here in this book that God gave us all kinds of examples about to help us understand that if we don't deal with our default, we will create all kind of chaos in our life. The enemy will allow that destruction to come and explode. And so we have to be willing to say, hey, I will deal with my default. I was reading in Genesis one day um, and reading of God's promise to Abraham and Sarah. Abraham is Father Abraham, had many sons, right? Many sons have Father Abraham. Okay, no one knows that one but me. All right, uh, right arm, left arm. It was just, I don't know, it's the thing we did when we were kids. Uh, Father Abraham is the father of the Israelite nation. He's the one that God promised to make. Uh, he said, your, your descendants will be as many as the stars in the sky. The problem was when he said that to him, he was somewhere between the age of 75 and 85 years old, and he and his wife had still never had any children. And so God promised something, but yet it wasn't happening. In Genesis 16, it says that his wife Sarah just gets tired of waiting. And I've read this story a bunch of times, and, she, and so I, I knew it in its context. What happens is she ends up going to her husband in Genesis 16 too. She says, the Lord has prevented me from having children. Go and sleep with my servant. Perhaps I can have children through her. The Bible's crazy. It's like its own telenovela. Y'all, it's crazy. <laughs> but she does that, and then he says yes, uh, and then all of the, the, then her servant gets pregnant, her name's Hagar, with a baby, and then all kinds of chaos ensues. Because now, servant is bitter at her, and she's bitter and jealous at her, and, and all of this uh, is a mess. And the baby's name is Ishmael. So then in, in Genesis 17, it says that Abraham was 86 years old when Ishmael was born. Then in Genesis 17, God comes and gives Abraham a promise again. Even though you screwed it all up, even though you brought all kind of destruction on your life, I'm still the God who's going to do my promise and bring it to fulfillment. Even though she said, the Lord has prevented me from having children. We like to blame it on God when things don't go the way we want them to, right? But he says, I'm still going to give you the promise that I promised. And, and, and Abraham's like, wait a minute, I'm 100, she's 90, are you serious? But it comes to pass. Isaac is born, their son Isaac. And, but this time as I'm reading it, I have this new understanding and revelation that Sarah's not just like this horrible lady who just did this weird telenovela thing. Her whole purpose in life is to produce a child, to have a baby for her family. That is a woman's one like thing, especially in this time of the world. And she can't do it. And so I imagine there's so many months of pain and hurt and hope that's broken. And I imagine that at a certain point she keeps looking, and can you imagine, if God promises you something, aren't you telling everybody about it? Can you imagine she goes to Bunko and they're like, where's that baby God promised you? I thought it was coming, right? I thought you had this God who really would answer prayer. What's wrong with you that he hasn't yet done it? And I imagine that eventually the default in her life became that she must control every situation so that she's not hurt any more than she's already been. And as I read it this time, I'm like, God, I do not want to create Ishmael's in my life just because I won't deal with the defaults. And she also caused chaos for the next generation. And as a mom, come on, y'all. 
I realized that the defaults I don't deal with become generational curses and defaults for the next generation. And so if you came and you felt like, your fight or flight was like, I'm going to go. I'm going I'm to not come back. <laughs> if you felt a little defensive, I, I just want you to know our prayer and God's hope for you. And what the Holy Spirit wants to help you with is simply this. To not get a hacksaw or a pickaxe and to just go at you. To not just hack it away and say, you suck, what is going on in your life? What's your default? But instead to just gently and quietly allow the Holy Spirit to lower down a bucket into your soul and to allow you to just, just let the Holy Spirit put it in the bucket so that then all you gotta do is dig it out and dump it on the table and actually examine it. Because it's never gonna be labeled unless we label it. It's never gonna be examined unless we examine it. And it is up to us to take this step. And the great beautiful thing about our God is he promises that the Holy Spirit is with us the whole time. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight. 28, just in case you're like, okay, cool, I get all the reasons, but I still don't like it, I don't wanna do it. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight 28 says, everyone ought to examine themselves. It says everyone ought to examine themselves to see if they are in the faith. Do you have the faith to trust that God will actually do what he promises and that if you dump out your defaults before him, that he can start to heal and he can start to repair? The beautiful thing about all the defaults that I've worked through and the ones I'm still working through is that there is opportunity for healing. There is opportunity to just say sorry. There is opportunity to start again. It's never too late to deal with your default. But we have to take the time to deal with it, to dump it out, and then to connect the dots. We have to trace the origin of our default so that the devil loses his opportunity to bring destruction. So the devil, or is it our default? It's probably both. So for me, I had to really like totally map it out and recognize that it wasn't just the chaotic home I grew up in. I also was a pastor's kid, which meant I went to church and I didn't go to a church like this. There was never a lady who stood on stage at a church and said, I used to yell and curse and scream at my family and God still loves me so I can still preach. That did not happen in my church. The church I grew up in, you don't talk about none of that. And if anybody found out, you'd be in big trouble. You ain't, yeah, it definitely ain't standing up here. So I had to recognize that it wasn't just the environment I grew up in of, of the chaos in my home. It was also a default to, under, to feel like I had to be perfect in order to be worthy enough for God's love. Worthy enough for him to actually care for me. And then because of that, I built a defensiveness to prove, yes, I am. Yes, I am doing it right. Yes, I will. And in the home I grew up in, you didn't really ever know if you were, um, <laughs> you were always pretty much wrong. Your criticism was going to come. So therefore, there's an extra layer of defensiveness. And that created in me explosive behavior. Because yelling and screaming, I learned, was more acceptable than crying and throwing fit in that way. So because yelling and screaming is more acceptable, that's the one I went to. But then that caused people pleasing everywhere else in my life because I don't need them to know about that and I'm gonna pretend like everything's great and if I can just keep the peace everywhere around me then actually we won't get in those moments because the only reason I'm exploding is when I lose control. When it's outside of my control, when it doesn't go the way I want it to. And can I just tell you, most of my life hasn't gone the way I planned that I thought it would. Does that happen to anybody else in the room? Oh, okay, that's what I thought. And that made me also very guarded. There were people that I loved deeply and they would come to our church and then something silly would happen and they would be so mad. And last week they loved me and they were gonna be my friend forever. And then the next week, all of a sudden, peace, we're never talking to you again. That abandonment created a very guardedness in my heart that then was coupled by the moment when my dad left that felt like abandonment, even though I'm 30 years old and married and live in a different state, it still felt like abandonment, which added more to the flashing light chaos. 
But because it's more acceptable to explode, that also means it's not acceptable to be emotional. So then I became a very non-emotional person. No, it's not that you think, oh, I'm a woman, and, I, and women don't need to cry, and I'm just a girl that doesn't cry. No, you are refusing to look at how you feel and to deal with your emotions because you're so caught up in how it looks to everybody else. I mean, the pattern of spending money just became the only little hit of a high that I could have somewhere in my life because I'm not gonna like to smoke and drink and do crazy drugs or have an affair. I'm not gonna do these things because I'm going to do it all correctly. And so then I just racked up a ton of credit card debt because, because yeah, because I'm so afraid. There was so much fear that my life would turn out differently than I was trying to make it turn out. There was so much fear that my home would look like a home I didn't want it to look like. There was so much fear that my children would someday feel even an inch of the way I felt. And the truth is they're going to, and the truth is they do. And the truth is they're gonna go to counseling, and the truth is they're gonna have to lower their own bucket. But until I was willing to just dump it out and say, here's the things that are popping off, I, I really could not get freedom from it. He who the Son sets free is free indeed. But we are humans, emotional humans, who if we do not deal with what's happening on the inside of us, the enemy can just use this little bit, it's just little. It's not that big a deal, it kind of locks, it kind of shuts. But if we want full freedom and the full more that he has for us, we have to be willing to dump it out. And then I had to dump the other side. I had to be willing to say, okay, where did that come from? Well, there's a lack of worthiness in my life. I don't feel worthy. I feel like I must earn everything and I don't feel like I'm just loved just the way I am. So there's a lack of worthiness. There's a sense of abandonment that I really feel from people that have left and from family that has left and the fear that it will happen again, there was unpredictability in my life. I moved around a ton when I was young. There was unpredictability in the chaos of the home that I grew up in and everything was out of my control. All kinds of things were out of my control. And so the control came really from being out of control, right? And the chaos that was around me all the time just was part of the peace that built all the defaults in me. Which then in chaos, you always feel misunderstood. Because I'm trying to tell you how I feel. I'm trying to express to you in the best way, but because of your defensiveness, you can't hear me. And so now I'm just misunderstood. And people like to think that people think the way they think. So they project things on you that they think that are not even what you think, right? <laughs> exactly, huh? Right. But it came from a place of realizing and recognizing that many of the people in my life who were supposed to emotionally support me actually were emotionally unavailable. They were dealing with their own junk. They had their own stuff that they were dealing with and they hadn't really put it in the bucket and, and dumped it out yet. And so because of that, they were emotionally unavailable. That left me not knowing where to place my emotions. And from that, so much criticism from being misunderstood from any time I tried to present my emotions. And so I had to look at it and go, okay, here's where it came from, here's what it is. And then I had to connect the dots. I just had to say, okay, I'm controlling because things were out of my control. I'm defensive because I was misunderstood. I'm explosive because there was so much chaos around me, right? I, I'm people pleasing because I, I don't wanna be abandoned again. I, I struggle with overspending just because there's this lack of worthiness in me. If I just buy one more pair of jeans, then maybe I will finally feel the way I think I will feel loved and accepted and people think I'm so cute, right? I'm guarded and not emotional because there was not the right people to be emotionally available to me to help me understand how to process the people that left, how to process the things I was feeling. I, I, I'm striving for perfection because I'm just, I just tired of the criticism. I don't want it anymore. And I've got this fear just because life is unpredictable. 
everything is unpredictable. And it wasn't until I literally drew these lines in my mind and my heart and understood them that I could then pour them out to the Holy Spirit and say, here you go, you gotta help me fix it. You're the only one who can make me feel worthy. You're the only one who's never gonna leave. You're the only one who actually I can trust and know is gonna be exactly who you said that you were. You're the only one who brings control. You're the only one who's not chaotic. You're the only one who actually understands me. Your word says you know me from the inside out. You knit me together in my mother's womb. You're the only one who can solve it. You're the only one that I can pour my heart out to and you're never gonna judge me. You're never gonna send me away. You're never gonna tell me to suck it up until I've got it all out and then we'll make a new plan, right? And you're not gonna criticize me. You're gonna love me and then help me grow because you didn't come to condemn, you came to save. And man, I'm telling you, it set me free. It set my whole life free in a way to a whole nother level that now, yeah, when I hear this sermon series, I'm like, I'm so excited, let's do this thing because there's always more. There are still right now defaults that I'm working through, but thankfully they're just like yellow and not a big issue yet. And thankfully I've learned the manual enough to know how to take care of them. And I know that this is mine. I had like my name on it at first and all that. I'm like, no, just this is my story. What's yours? I had to make a list because just trying to help you, sometimes we need like a, a, a jumping off point. Maybe you're impulsive. Maybe you're addicted to substances or gambling or sex. Maybe you're addicted to working. You're a workaholic. Maybe you have a fear of commitment or maybe you're codependent. Maybe you're flaky. Maybe you are shakable in all kinds of things. You get shaken up. You can't handle it. Maybe you're entitled. You think the world owes you something. Maybe you're spoiled. Maybe you are helpless feeling. Maybe you curse and yell and lie. Maybe you're manipulative. Maybe you're easily angered. Maybe you're insecure, but you try to present it as humility. Maybe you're apologetic everywhere you are because you second guess yourself. And can I tell you, all of that will really leave you depressed. I don't know what your story is. I don't know what your pieces are. What I know is that for a lot of us, we grew up with instability. Many of us grew up poor or constantly moving. Maybe you were orphaned or disowned. You were defenseless because the people who should have defended you didn't. And that left you feeling hopeless and like you never had a place to call home. Maybe you had physical abuse or sexual abuse or emotional abuse in your life. Maybe you were abandoned. Maybe you walked through divorce with your parents or you walked through divorce yourself. Maybe you were cheated on. Maybe you were manipulated. Maybe you were deceived and betrayed. We've all been deceived and betrayed by somebody at some point in our life. Maybe you grew up in an overly religious place where it was all about the rules, not about the relationship with Jesus. And that left you confused about who God is and is he a good God and a loving God or is he an angry God ready to smite me? Maybe you grew up so pressured to be a certain way or become a certain thing or get the certain grade. Maybe you were always under somebody else's thumb and you didn't have the freedom to actually be yourself. Maybe there's so many previous failures that if everybody ever found out it would be devastating, and so therefore, now you just can't start. Maybe you've lost loved ones in your life, and though you said, oh, it's okay, they're with Jesus now, I'm all right, it's still deep within you, and you haven't dealt with the grief of it. And what you have to do then, I, this is just a list I made, I just asked Jesus, give me some words. You have to start drawing them to, themselves and say, hey, look, and then the more you draw them, the more you see that they actually go to multiple places, and then you keep drawing more lines and say, oh, this came from here, and that came from there, and everybody's is gonna be different, and everybody's is gonna look different, but I promise you that, some, that everyone has something on one of these lists. And then you have your own list. But the more you draw the lines, the more you see this mess. It's a mess. I asked them to draw these intentionally crazy because that's what I finally found out. At first, I just drew the lines and they were perfect and straight. But the more I decided to dig, the more I realized that I just had to keep pulling the thread. I know y'all been staring at me like, why does she have sticking out her jacket this whole time? 
But to connect the dots, you have to be willing to pull the thread, to see where it leads, and to understand that really they're all kind of raveled up together and tied together. And you have to be willing to do it. It's all connected. It's all woven together by the same thread. But the good part about that is that when it's all connected, we can lay the whole thing at Jesus' feet. That when it all really is a whole mess, then we can give it to him. But we have to start. We have to start actually going, here's what happened. Here's how it made me feel. Here's what, here's the hurt that it caused. And that's why being here on Sundays is a big deal. Leaning in when there's an opportunity to be vulnerable and transparent is a big deal. The intentionality of our church is to be a transparent and vulnerable place so that, Pastor Trustman says, so that we can be a canvas to, that you can paint upon of our life so that you can reflect what it looks like to, to be more and more like Jesus. It's not fun, y'all. <laughs> Literally, after first service, I walked around the lobby like, does everyone still pleased with me and think it's okay that I shared all those things with you? But, but, it's, but it's necessary. Because whatever is connected to us then gets connected to them. What's in us comes out of us. And look at it all. If we don't deal with it, then we're just walking around with this every day in our life. We're just carrying it everywhere we go. And the more you carry it, you ever traveled with your necklaces? They get all tangled, twisted up, and then they're all, you can't get them apart, and now it's just ruined. And if you don't start pulling on the thread in your life, those red five alarm lights someday will cause real destruction. And it's not always fun, but you've got to be willing to say, Holy Spirit, show me, teach me, allow me to connect it here. And now that I've processed that and dealt with this, now will you keep letting me deal with it again so that I can lay it at your feet and I can let you take control. And sometimes here in this place, uh, you get to a moment where it's hard and you get stuck and you need some help. The amount of times my husband has had to help me keep pulling the thread, there's too many to count but also God's given me great community in my life of people that I can say, hey, can you take this? Can you pull it out and help me? Can you show me the blind spot or the place where I'm trying to be self-aware? But sometimes there's things I just can't see. And so my challenge to you this week is just to take the time to actually dump it out, to actually examine it, because what I know and believe is that he will do exceedingly more. He's a faithful God who will not return void. He will show up. He will take whatever you are allowing him to pull on and he'll heal it and he'll deadbolt the door. I watched my friend Tina. She's like, what? (laughs) I've watched my friend Tina pull on a whole lot of threads. Her and Mike have been through a whole lot of things, but they've been willing to dig it out, to share it with the people around them, to say, hey, you don't have to stay here because I didn't have to stay here. Look what God did in my life. I, I, I see it all over the place of people who are willing in this house to keep pulling the thread, but then once you pull it, you gotta keep pulling, right, Jay? Jay's been doing all kind of deep work so proud of the man that you are compared to the man you showed up as. That's a beautiful thing. It's okay to show up, not okay. But God helps us start to become more and more like him. I talked to Myra in between services and she said, we already bought three buckets and put them on our mantle so that we can start putting cards in. And Myra, what God's done for you and Nathan is insane. When they showed up here, they allowed themselves to go through re-engage. If you haven't gone through re-engage and you're married, I don't know what you're doing. But they allowed themselves to go through it to heal a whole bunch of junk. But then they took the next step to lead another group. Last Sunday night, we sat and I was amazed of the stories of the healing and the freedom that God brought. 
And I wasn't there leading them. Rachel wasn't there leading them. Pastor Trussell wasn't there leading them. Myra, Myra was leading them. The groups around the table, they were bringing freedom because the truth of God's word sets everything free. Aida is a lady who has worked through some of the deepest, darkest stuff in her deep soul to stop the defaults that the enemy literally had red five alarm about to make it a whole emergency to crash and burn. But she said, that's not, that's not for me. I'm gonna take this moment and I'm gonna allow God to turn it into something beautiful. And that's what we have the opportunity to do. And as I've been praying for you, I just feel like it's so important that we understand that we pull the thread and then we just keep pulling. Right, Kyle? Because there's a generation coming after us. In God's kindness, he places us with the right people and the right children in the right home. He knows what he's doing, but it's up to us to keep pulling it. Because in this season right now, with a little lady, there's stuff. But when she gets older and older, there'll be more stuff. What I've learned is the older my kids get, there's more things I gotta deal with, understanding what it looks like. Because the enemy's sneaky, y'all. And you think you've dealt with something, but then a new season comes and you see it in a different perspective. And all of a sudden, whoa, I'm proud of you, Bailey. I'm super proud of you. And I know you don't like to pull them, but you're doing a good job. We just have to keep pulling and allow the Holy Spirit to heal. My prayer for you this week for everyone has been one for the ones in the room who are like, no, not for me, that you would understand that this is actually a gift of God's kindness, that he allows us to be set free, that he doesn't leave us where he found us, but that he takes us from more to more to more. I'm gonna leave these up here and if anybody needs them, they can come get them. To remind yourself, it's worth continuing to pull. And then I, the rest of my prayer has been that for those of you, well, once you are okay with it, so now all of you, uh, we'll get started. I've heard from so many people that at the last encounter night when Pastor Trustin uh, gave us 15 minutes, it changed all kinds of things for all kinds of people. When was the last time you just took 15 minutes to just dump it out to say, okay, all right, Holy Spirit, here we go. I'm gonna let you, I'm gonna let you put it all in there. And then I'm gonna pull it out and dump it out and lay it out. My challenge for you this week is that you would just take 15 minutes, dump all the things, what's popping off, what's flowing out of you. If you don't know and you're having a hard time, put your defensive dukes down and ask somebody around you. Ask them, the people that love you, to speak truth to you and receive it. The Bible tells us wounds from a friend can be trusted. I'm so thankful for the wounds that I've gotten from friends who love me deeply to help me grow. I mean, try to dump out where it came from. This one might take longer. I'm still identifying things that I'm like, oh yeah, that's this and that's where it came from and this is why it's connected. But the more you do it, the easier it gets and the quicker you're able to stop the attack of the enemy. And as we start talking more about his strategies and understand where he's trying to get us over the next few weeks, if we have at least started to identify some defaults, then he will lose that foothold in your life. And so I'm just praying for you and encouraging you and challenging you. Take 15 minutes, dump it out this week and allow the Holy Spirit to start connecting the dots and healing what's broken. We're so glad that you joined us for today's message. We couldn't do the ministry that we do here at this house without the help of our partners. And so if you'd like to join us in everything that God is doing in this house, we'd invite you to scan this QR code so that you can help jump alongside us in this journey. Thanks for joining in. We'll see you next week. And remember, there's more.